You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. Kristen Hyman is a cop, or the 30-year-old woman from New Jersey wants to be a cop. The odds seem to be stacked against her at the moment. Because six days before she was due to be sworn in as a sheriff's officer in Hudson County, after completing her training, Hyman was suspended without pay. Because some videos she made as a fetish model and pro-dom in her early 20s were brought to the attention of the sheriff's office, most likely by a vindictive ex. The sheriff's department claims her conduct was unbecoming of a public employee and would subject the Hudson County Sheriff's Office to ridicule. But the world only found out about these videos and, frankly, the Hudson County Sheriff's Office after they attempted to fire and successfully outed Hyman. If they'd shrugged these videos off, we wouldn't be talking about this. We wouldn't know about it. But they tried to fire Hyman, which forced her to lawyer up and sue, which made the news. And now if anyone is coming in for ridicule, it's Hyman. The New York City tabloids pounced. The New York Post did its lurid, sex-phobic, kink-shaming worst, dragging Hyman, putting her on the cover of the paper, and unleashing a thousand stupid BDSM puns. Because Lord knows there's nothing else going on in the world right now. It'll be a miracle if Hyman, who faces a disciplinary hearing next week, emerges with her job. It'll be a miracle if she ever gets another job. So she's just another example of our culture's hypocrisy and vindictiveness when it comes to women and sex work. The moralists and scolds and sex phobes insist that all sex work is abuse, that it's exploitative, and that any woman who is doing or has done sex work, even legal sex work that doesn't involve sex like fetish modeling or stripping, is a victim who deserves our sympathy and needs to be rescued from the pimps and the pornographers and the traffickers. But if they discover a woman who used to do sex work, they attack her and try to get her fired from the job she's doing now, whatever it is. So Hyman, who has worked as a 911 dispatcher and an EMT, emergency medical technician, since leaving sex work, is probably going to lose the job she has now. The message to people who are doing sex work couldn't be clearer. We don't want you to do that thing you're doing now, but we won't let you do anything else either. Okay, now, this is going to be an extremely awkward segue, but I have a point to make. Please bear with me. Geronimo Yanez was acquitted last week. He's the cop in St. Anthony, Minnesota, who shot and killed Philando Castile in front of Castile's girlfriend and her daughter in July of last year. Yanez was charged with secondary manslaughter and dangerous discharge of a firearm in the shooting, the aftermath of which was live-streamed on Facebook by Castile's distraught, his terrorized girlfriend. The defense argued that Castile had his gun in his hand and Yanez had no choice but to execute him. Castile did have a gun on him, a gun he purchased legally. Castile had a concealed weapons permit, and he informed Yanez that he was armed. Yanez, his gun already drawn because, car full of black people, demanded Castile's license and shot him to death when he reached for it. The defense claimed Castile had his gun in his, quote, continuous grip. But all the evidence from the scene and the dash cam video, and the testimony of Castile's girlfriend, and the testimony from medical first responders, EMTs like Harmon, disputed the defense's case. Castile wasn't reaching for his gun. He was reaching for his license, as instructed. Castile's gun wasn't in his hand. It was in his pocket. Yanez fired seven rounds. Five bullets struck Castile. And as the AP reported during the trial... Prosecutor Jeff Paulson highlighted autopsy evidence in his closing argument, reminding the jury of a bullet wound to what would have been Castile's trigger finger and that there was no corresponding bullet damage nor wounds in the area of Castile's right shorts pocket where he carried his gun. If a bad cop like Giannis can't be found guilty, and not of murder but the lesser charge of manslaughter, with this kind of evidence stacked up against him, It's essentially legal for trigger-happy cops to murder black people in this country. And before you can say, this has got to stop, it happens again. It happened again this weekend in Seattle, where a 30-year-old black woman, Charlena Lyles, was gunned down in front of her children after she called the cops to report a burglary. This morning, reading about Lyles, also still reading about Philando Castile, a detail from a reported slate leapt out at me. 
The city of St. Anthony, for which Yanez worked as an officer, said it would end his employment because, quote, the public will be best served if Officer Yanez is no longer a police officer in our city. The city promised to offer Yanez a voluntary separation agreement to help him transition to another career. A voluntary separation agreement. That's code, I believe, for a severance package so generous that Yanez agrees to leave the force willingly and to go quietly. And again, he's going to get help. Help transitioning to another career. Yanez gets help. Hyman gets destroyed. She pretended to beat up a few white men who enjoy getting beat up by pretty women, and she gets fired and dragged and humiliated and rendered so infamous she may never be able to get another job in her life. Yanez gets a pile of money and help finding a new job. Something is deeply rotten. Something is deeply fucked up when a cop who kills a black man for no reason gets this kind of TLC, while a woman who did consensual sex work, a woman who made some fucking videos and killed no one, she gets destroyed. Hyman dragged through the mud. If she loses her job, she'll get no help transitioning to another career, no generous severance package. Do sex work. Again, even legal sex work that involves no nudity or sexual contact, and your professional life is over. Shoot and kill a black man in cold blood for no reason on video. And not only won't you go to jail, as we've seen with so many other cases, you probably won't even face charges. And if you do face charges, the odds that you will be found guilty are vanishingly small. Something, so many things, are deeply fucked up. Okay, coming up on today's show, tons of your questions, lots of my answers, and joining us in the Magnum edition of the Savage Lovecast, which you can subscribe to at www.savagelovecast.com. Writer Michael Hobbs is here to discuss his recent essay on gay loneliness. All that coming up on today's show in the micro and the magnum. Today's Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Me Undies, high quality, super comfortable, good looking undies. Get 20% off your first order when you go to MeUndies.com slash savage. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron delivers all fresh, high quality ingredients and recipes you need to create delicious home cooked meals. Get your first three meals for free by going to BlueApron.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm calling from Berlin, hoping to hear your thoughts on something my girlfriend and I experienced last week. We were having dinner at a restaurant, and I see her eyes open in the direction of a couple sitting at a table away from ours. I turn, and at first I think the woman is having a seizure, but it quickly becomes apparent that she's in the middle of an orgasm with her man's hands down her pants. They finish and leave. My girl and I are left sitting in shock and disgust. We consider ourselves to be sexually open and non-judgmental, and we both agree that if this had happened in a bar or the corner of a club, we would have been fine with it. But this was outside of a restaurant on a busy street in broad daylight. We've both been surprised by how appalled by this we are, feeling like this couple forced their sexual intimacy and intensity into our eyeballs without our permission. Are we right to feel this way, or are we actually judgmental? Would it have been okay for us to tell them to knock that the fuck off? asking them to deal with their shamelessness instead of leaving it with us. This is a fascinating test case, uh, the way you lay it out, because what you witnessed that day in the restaurant, on that patio, on that street, in broad daylight, a, a man with his hands down this woman's pants, bringing her to climax in public, would have been fine with you if it had been a bar or a club, theoretically one of Berlin's sleazier bars or clubs where this sort of thing happens. Because then by walking in the door, you're saying, I'm prepared to witness that sort of thing, that this is the Bergen. This is the kind of place where that could happen. So I'm down. And I know that by being here, I have, in a sense, consented to witnessing God knows what, including a man with his hand on a woman's pants, bring her to climax. So it wasn't what was forced into your eyes that so offends you. It's where and when it was forced into your eyes because your implicit consent to witness acts of sexual depravity or public sexual display couldn't be inferred. You hadn't, in a sense, consented by walking through the door and paying the cover charge at, I think it's called the Bergen. And so it wasn't okay. But I'm a little mystified by the depth of your offense because in a way you're saying, you know, there's a time and a place for that. There's a time and a place where I am down to see that this was not the time or place. So you're offended because this happened in a place where your consent couldn't be inferred. 
But it also sounds like you're offended on behalf of others who might not want to see this sort of thing or offended on behalf of the people that you two could be but aren't because you're clearly the kind of people who would be fine seeing something exactly like this happen somewhere else, but you're not fine seeing it happen where it happened. So it's not what happened, it's where. And you focus on broad daylight in public on a busy street, anyone could have seen this and they had no way of knowing if the people watching it would have been okay with seeing something like this. But you and your girlfriend are fine with seeing something like this. They just couldn't know it. So the offense is their presumption and their inconsideration and their rudeness, not necessarily the act itself because you are in the right place, right time, fine with the act itself. Not the place, not the time, not fine with it because they couldn't know that some other place, some other time you would consent to watching something like this or seeing something like this. And so they were rude and inconsiderate and they did in a way shove this into your eyeballs, eyeballs that would have been receptive to this very thing. If your eyeballs were at the Bergen or in some club or bar where this sort of thing happens. Did you have a right to say to them, knock it the fuck off? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. You could have said to them, knock it the fuck off, not the time or place. Look at that bus full of kids going by or whatever you wanted to cite at that moment, you could have spoken up. If they felt entitled to perform a sex act in public, you could certainly feel entitled to say, Jesus fucking Christ, not the time, not the place. And I think that's what you should have gone with because that is the issue. Not the time, not the place. Take that to the Bergen. Take that to a club. Take that someplace where people are by walking through the door, consenting to witnessing these sorts of things. If you are into public sex, there are venues, there are public places that you can go where you're not going to violate someone's consent. And you're not going to identify yourself as rude and inconsiderate and awful. And that's why you're offended by these people. It's not the sex act, again, which you would have been fine seeing elsewhere. It's the presumption and the violation of consent that can be inferred. And not necessarily your consent, but maybe the consent of others. Maybe you're offended on behalf of the broader public. People in Berlin, the one or two people in Berlin who aren't fine with seeing something like this happening in a restaurant, on a patio, in broad daylight, on a busy street. Hi, Dan. I'm a 27-year-old female currently living in Philadelphia. I'm straight. Recently, I got out of a -a three-and-a-half-year relationship. And at the end of the relationship, I definitely felt like it was somewhat emotionally abusive. And that was partially due to my partner's, uh, what became an abuse of, I think, drugs and alcohol. We've been broken up about three months, but we had dogs together. And so I had some contact with him. And since breaking up, he has uh, become a member of AA and been consistently going to meetings. He has gotten a therapist and he's overall getting his life together. Some part of me wants to reconcile, but I want to know if you have any suggestions on when is it the right time to know that it's good to get back together, especially since this person is dealing with other issues, or is there something that should just, maybe if we broke up and he has a lot of other issues, maybe it's just time for me to move on. I still have feelings there, but uh, I think that even if we do reconcile, some of our problems are still the same. Like, I have not that much time, and sometimes I think that he wants me to spend more time with him, and especially since he stopped drinking, I feel like he sometimes is fixated over if I call him back or whatever, which then makes me feel a little uncomfortable about the emotionally abusive stuff, but he really is working on himself, and I'm really proud of him for getting better. But again, I want to know your opinion on what is the right thing to do, and when do you know it's okay to get back together? Or is there ever a right time? Now is not the time to get back together. I'm not saying you couldn't get back together at some point in the future, but now, right now, is not the time. He's working on himself, but he's only been working on himself for three months. And I'm always suspicious in a case like this where someone gets dumped because they have a drug or alcohol problem or they're emotionally abusive and they suddenly right the ship. They suddenly get their act together. And the question then becomes, is this getting their act together an act just to get the girlfriend or boyfriend who dumped them back? And if the goal isn't to get their life together, but to get their girlfriend or boyfriend back, and it's just an act, the act often stops after the boyfriend or girlfriend is back. So I think you have to let this play out 
for longer, a lot longer. It's been three months. I think you need to give it at least another nine or 12 more months. Presumably your dogs are not going to die in the next three weeks and you guys are going to be in some sort of contact ongoing and indefinitely. So there's no rush. You're not going to lose touch. And you will be able to see by interacting with him around the dogs whether this is a sustained effort on his part to get his shit together, not to win you back, but for himself to get his shit together, whether or not he ever gets back together with you. And if that's the case, if enough time goes by, a year, a year and a half, two years, and he's good and healthy and on his feet and off drugs and alcohol and maybe a little less needy and controlling about when you call him back because you are a busy person – At that point, if he is still single and you are still single, perhaps you can think about getting back together. But for right now, what you have to tell yourself is this is over. We are not getting back together. That's also what he needs to tell himself so that he is doing this, that he's doing this work, working on himself for the right reasons, which is for himself and for the rest of his life so he can have a healthy life going forward, whether he's with you or alone or with someone else. And same for you. You need to tell yourself it's over so that you can move on with your life in case this isn't sustained, in case this is an act or in case he collapses or succumbs again to drugs and alcohol. You don't want to spend the next year, year and a half, two years in a state of suspended relationship animation in limbo, waiting around to see if he's better and you can dive back in because that's not guaranteed. So... He gets on with his life and gets on with working on himself. You get on with your life. You get on also with your dating and romantic life. He may be a part of your dating and romantic life in the future or not. But he needs to get on with working on himself, whether you're part of his romantic future or not. And you need to do the same. You need to move on too, which includes dating other people and operating under the assumption that you two are not getting back together. Which, again, is not to say that you two couldn't get back together. But you have to assume for now, for him, for his sake, and for yours, that that's not going to come to pass. Hey, everybody. Guess who wants to help you celebrate queer pride? Me, undies. Because everybody knows that the gays and the lesbians and the bi's and the trans, we take our underpants very seriously. And you know what, straight people? So should you. MeUndies makes the ultimate feel-good underpants with free shipping right to your door, satisfaction guaranteed. Designed in LA, every pair of MeUndies is made with micromodal, a fabric three times softer than cotton, and I can attest to that personally because I'm wearing a pair right now. Their soft, stretchy undies come to you in an ever-changing array of colors and patterns. No matter what your style, they've got something for you. And for every pair of special edition Celebrate Undies you buy during Pride, Me Undies is going to donate $1 to the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Their cute little rainbow polka dot undies to celebrate Pride, and you need at least one pair. And as if you need another reason to try Me Undies, they're offering 20% off your first pair and a satisfaction guarantee that you will love them or your money back. Just visit our URL, MeUndies.com slash Savage. Head to MeUndies today and pick up a pair of special edition Celebrate Underpants. You'll not only get a discount on awesome undies, you'll be donating to a very good cause. Check out MeUndies.com slash Savage today. Hey, Dan. I'm a cis, heterosexual, male, My most recent relationship ended about a month ago. It was due in part, I think, to a lot of just like jealousy I was harboring over, I guess, over some of the guys that my girlfriend was, um, or my girlfriend at the time was spending time with. And yeah, it was, uh, it was difficult. It wasn't something I was actively doing, like, I wasn't actively jealous, but she had an ex boyfriend from a year back who she kept like a photo of just like hanging in her room um, among other friends. But she had like specifically like a portrait picture of him in her room. She didn't have a portrait picture of me in her room. She kept like a shirt with his band on it. I don't know. Just like all of this old memorabilia and stuff from relationships past. It was pretty daunting and um, made me feel really insecure. And I guess I have a lot of my own insecurity issues I got to work out. But I addressed these things. Uh, When we broke up, I finally told her 
I probably should have said something a little earlier, but what's the deal when it comes to starting a new relationship fresh and then like seeing that sort of other side of someone? Like, are you like when, when you start a new relationship, are you sort of supposed to press the refresh button with old relationships so as not to scare your partner away? Or is it like, was I in the wrong? And is it fine to kind of have pieces of your old life lingering about? That's all I want to know. I needed to listen to your call a couple of times because I had to work out in my head what you were actually asking. You say, what's the deal when it comes to starting a new relationship fresh and then seeing that other side of someone? And what you mean there is, what's the deal when you get into a new relationship and you're made aware of the fact that your girlfriend, your new girlfriend or the new person you're with, has had other boyfriends before you. What's the deal with that? Well, the deal with that is that your girlfriend has had other boyfriends before you and you need to be okay with that unless you're going to date only virgins, which people being people and people being sexually active the way people are these days, you're not going to be dating only virgins. So the women that you're dating are going to have past relationships and relationships aren't all horrible. And sometimes relationships end and people still remember them fondly. Even if they don't remember them fondly, they hold on to memorabilia from these past relationships. And so if what you mean by what's the deal when it comes to starting a new relationship brush and then seeing that other side of someone, if what you mean by that other side is that that person had men was with men before you, you need to get the fuck over that. That's what that means. And when you say, when you start a new relationship, are you supposed to press the reset button with old relationships so as not to scare your new partner away? And I think what you mean by press the reset button is stuff all evidence down the memory hole to hide it, to discard it so that your new partner doesn't get it in his head that you had boyfriends and dick before him and his. And that's not reasonable. That's not a reasonable demand to make. That's not a reasonable expectation to have. If you're dating women who've had other relationships that may have been significant to them emotionally, that helped them grow and become the women that they are today, and if you're fond of the women that they are today, you should be grateful for the men in their life before you came along because they helped shape this person that you fell in love with. Not threatened by them, grateful for them. And then you say, or is it fine to have pieces of your old life lingering about, like that t-shirt, like the portrait hanging on the wall? And my answer to that is, well, it depends. A t-shirt that belonged to an old boyfriend that she remembers fondly, that maybe she's still Facebook friends with or chats with every once in a while on Twitter or Instagram or Kick or Snapchat or whatever the fuck, that's fine. A t-shirt folded up on the shelf that maybe she wears once in a while, fine. But a portrait hanging on the wall is a different thing. Now, you say she broke up with this guy a, a year ago. So you've been dating her, you were dating her for less time than... For, for less than a year, maybe less time than she dated this ex. And maybe she put his portrait up and just forgot it was there. It wasn't laying at bed at night when you weren't around with a vibrator staring into his eyes and masturbating. Just she hung a portrait of him and it didn't occur to her to take it down when her new boyfriend came into her life. When it comes to photographs, when it comes to that kind of memorabilia, the wisest course of action, the sensible and considerate thing to do is to tuck it away, is to put it in a photo album, put it in a drawer, put it in a box, not to hide it necessarily, not to pretend that this relationship never happened and doesn't matter, but to put it in its proper context. It's a keepsake. And so you put it where you put keepsakes and hope chests and drawers and boxes and photo albums. You don't put it on the wall, that kind of keepsake, a portrait. So uh, I think the issue with what your girlfriend was doing by keeping that portrait on the wall is different than keeping the t-shirt, different than having a past unreasonable to expect her to pretend she doesn't have a past to stuff everything down the memory hole to protect you and your ego from the news that she's dated other men. But there's just something about the, the photograph on the wall, the portrait being up that betrays what I like to call. And I think I'm the only person who ever talks about this bad judgment that even though there might be guys out there who are fine with the ex-boyfriend's portrait on the wall, odds are good that even guys who are fine with you having had ex-boyfriends, who are fine even meeting or hanging out with your boyfriends, are going to read into what might be interpreted as kind of a shrine to the ex-boyfriend, an attachment to the ex-boyfriend that is threatening because of the prominence of the placement of the portrait. 
A t-shirt balled up on the floor when it's dirty. A t-shirt folded up on a shelf when it's clean. A t-shirt that she might wear every once in a while is not in front of the boyfriend's face 24-7 whenever he's in the apartment. The portrait on the wall of the ex, kind of in the boyfriend's face 24-7. It would be reasonable of her. It would display good judgment for her to take the portrait down and tuck it away with memorabilia, tuck it away with other mementos of past relationships or just her past. I've gotten letters from people who went absolutely berserk when they found mementos of past relationships, not hanging on the wall, not balled up on the floor or in the laundry or occasionally on the back of the girlfriend, but in a box in the attic, a photo album from a, a wedding. Got a letter once from a woman who went losing her mind because her boyfriend had photo albums from his wedding to his ex-wife. Well, they had kids, he and his ex-wife did. And those photos might have been important to the kids one day. It is the marriage and the connection that led to their creation, to their existence. And it was unreasonable of her in the extreme to demand that her new boyfriend discard these photos from a very significant chapter of his life. That's a level of insecurity and batshittery that should not be accommodated. But hey, you know, it makes me a little uncomfortable to walk into your bedroom every time I come over and have to make eye contact with your ex-boyfriend. Can you put that away? Can you put that in a drawer or put it on a high shelf where when I'm fucking you and I look up at the wall briefly, I'm not staring into the face of your ex? That's a reasonable request. Put that away. The other things you're tiptoeing up to in this convoluted way in, in your questions, not okay. You will see the other side of someone. And if what you mean by the other side is their relationships in the past, people they've been with before, you will see that. You will come to know their romantic and, and relationship history the longer you're involved with them. So you will see that they don't have to pretend that they were virgins the night that you two met. And that's an unreasonable demand to make. And no, you don't have to press the reset button when you begin to date someone. You don't have to go through your house and discard and get rid of all evidence all mementos, all postcards, all t-shirts, all photographs, all souvenirs, knickknacks, bric-a-brac, acquired on trips with the ex or whatever with the ex. That does not have to be expunged. And anybody who demands that you throw all those things away is telling you that they're an insecure bag of slop who you probably don't want to be with. Probably don't want to be with your ex again. That's why your ex is your ex. But you don't want to be with someone who insists that you pretend that you have no exes. I'm a very important, busy man. That's what they tell me. That's what the tech savvy at risk youth tell me. And you know who else is important and busy? My husband. So sometimes we don't feel like schlepping to the store to get dinner on the table. And that is when we turn to Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. They make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, even me. Blue Apron achieves this by supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. For less than 10 bucks per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-proportioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you will never get bored. Customize your recipes each week based on your preferences, and Blue Apron has several delivery options to choose from, so you can choose the one that fits your needs. And there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Here are a couple items on the menu coming up. Chicken and crispy rice with summer squash, currants, and lemon yogurt, and spicy Korean rice cakes with rhubarb and asparagus. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash savage. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so do not wait. That's blueapron.com slash savage. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Hi, Dan. I'm calling because I'm dating a guy now for about a year and a half, and I broke my one of my rules to start dating this guy. Um, there was an immediate attraction. We had an instant connection, but he's not out to his family. Um, he's older than me. He's in his late 40s. I'm in my early 40s. We have a great connection, but I'm left alone on holidays. When his parents come to town, when his relatives come to town, which they're doing this weekend, I have to disappear. And it sucks. And I've been out since I'm 16, 15, actually. I came out to my mother, um, my father, when I was 17. I try to be understanding. His 
family is extremely homophobic. His dad sounds like a fucking asshole. I knew I shouldn't have broken my rule, and now I'm just torn. I feel like I should DTMFA, but I love him, so I don't know what to do. But part of me feels like I need to over up, as you say, and just kick him to the curb for now until he can change. You know, it seems like he's made his choice. He's not he's not available for an adult relationship. So I don't know. I was hoping you could push me towards, you know, what I need to do, or I guess I need to give him an ultimatum. I don't know, but hopefully you have some sage advice for me. Pretty simple question I want to put to you. Do you love him enough? Is the connection strong enough that you're willing to put up with this bullshit for the rest of your life? Having to disappear uh, when family comes to town, not being included around the holidays. And if you're not willing to put up with this for the rest of your life, how much longer are you willing to put up with it? One more Christmas, two more Christmases, three more Christmases. How long are you going to be his filthy, dirty little secret? If the answer is you don't want to put up with this for the rest of your life, then you have to set a timetable for exactly how much longer you're willing to put up with this bullshit. And that's the ultimatum that you go to him with. You say, look, I promised myself when I came out to my parents at 15 decades ago, when I took that risk to live authentically and to tell the truth about myself, I swore I would never date a closet case because to date a closet case is to be dragged back into the closet and the closet is a miserable place that I couldn't wait to get out of. I burst out of it. I left it when I was 15. So I am willing to put up with this shit for six more months, for one more year. And in that time, you need to find it in yourself to come out to your family or to break up with me or I'm going to break up with you because I'm not living like this for the rest of my life. Your boyfriend of 1.5 years has been dealing with his family for nearly 50 years and has made this choice to closet himself for 50 fucking years. The odds that your incentive enough for him to flip that table over for him to flip that script for him to open his fucking mouth and tell the truth to his fucking asshole. And yeah, you can say the F word on this show. You could drop the F bomb. I do it all the fucking time. The odds that he's going to come out to his fucking asshole father for you when he over the last 50 years hasn't been able to do it for himself are pretty slim. But there are lots of examples out there of people who coasted along being closeted having short-term or not very deep and loving relationships who then didn't finally tell the truth, didn't finally come out until they met someone and were so in love with that person and so attached to that person that when that person said, it's the closet or it's me, it's the truth or I'm out, they chose to come out. They chose to leave the closet for that person. No guarantees. I can't promise you your boyfriend of 1.5 years is going to choose to out himself to his asshole family or come out to his asshole family to keep you in his life. Again, for nearly 50 years or 35 years since he was 15 years old, he's been making this choice to, to, to stay closeted. Maybe he'll, maybe for you, he'll come out. Odds are slim, but you got to set a timetable. You have to give him that ultimatum and start that clock ticking. You will put up with this for six more months. You will put up with this for one more Christmas, whatever it is. And at the end of that time, if he has not come out to his family and come out about being in a relationship with you, the relationship with you is over and he can continue to have this shitty, dishonest, warping relationship with his family instead. Hi, Dan. I am calling for the first time. I'm a 25-year-old bisexual woman who lives in Southern California. And I've been dating a guy for about six months now. And when we first started dating, he expressed to me that he is by nature a polyamorous person. I dabbled a little bit with having multiple partners um, separately from each other, but I have never really considered myself anything other than monogamous. So he entered into a monogamous relationship with me. He's the one who propositioned it. He was excited, you know, to get to know me on a deeper level. But now that we have gotten to know each other on a somewhat deeper level, um, these things are starting to come up again in the way of having a threesome. And this just keeps being an issue. Uh, so, And we talk about it so much, though, that 
it's not even sexy to me anymore. And it's almost becoming this issue of like, am I willing to compromise or is he willing to compromise if we never open up the relationship? Um, he did tell me at the beginning of the relationship that there's no reason, you know, why he would see in the future uh, needing to open up the relationship, that he's, that was not a issue in his mind. But then, you know, today he said that he doesn't know if he would ever be okay uh, with not opening up the relationship. So my question to you is, should I try it? I'm not really interested in it, but it's kind of one of those things. It's like, how do I know if I don't try it? Or am I right in kind of knowing myself and knowing my insecurities and thinking that I'm just not cut out for that kind of relationship? Um, sorry if this is a little bit um, vague, but I'm just a little bit confused on like, what to do when somebody is primarily polyamorous and the other partner is primarily monogamous, but we're still interested in finding a middle ground because everything else is so perfect. You ask if there's a middle ground, a compromise position between poly and open and monogamy. And part of me wants to tell you that there isn't. That's a binary. You're either open or not open. If you two have sex with other people, you're not monogamous. And if you two don't have sex with people, you are. And there's no fudging that. It's a binary. You are or you aren't. But there are people out there who've described their relationships as monogamous, mostly gay men in these studies of monogamous gay male couples where the researchers will divide the gay guys up who self-identify as either in being open relationships or being in closed monogamous relationships. And when they interview the guys in the closed monogamous relationships, the self-identified monogamous gay couples, they often found that these quote unquote monogamous gay male couples were having threesomes every once in a while. And that was to them an aspect of their monogamous commitment. They only had sex with each other and they only had sex with other people with each other. So they were monogamous. And for them, in a way, it wasn't necessarily the black and white binary I just described. Would that work for you? I don't know. You say, should I give this a try? And it sounds like you did give it a try. At the top of your call, you talked about how you experimented with seeing multiple partners at once uh, earlier in your life, and that just wasn't for you, and you walked away from that. So when you say give it a try, I assume you mean give a threesome a try, where there would be no ongoing relationship, that it wouldn't be a polyamorous thing. Maybe give threesomes a try. Maybe that would work for you the same way it works for those gay male couples. Maybe not. Threesomes are a little more complicated for opposite sex couples than they are for same sex couples. Two guys who are going to bed with another guy can enjoy that guy equally, potentially. A woman who's going to bed with another woman and her boyfriend, if she's not bisexual, what's in it for her? Right? It's if she's not bisexual, she can't take equal pleasure in this very special guest star. You are bisexual, however. So maybe you could take equal pleasure in a very special guest star. So maybe you should give it a try. That said, you're going to also have to be very clear about your boundaries. Your boyfriend at the start told you he was poly, but being monogamous was the price of admission that he was willing to pay to be with you. He tells you now, and obviously is constantly talking about and pressuring you to have a three-way with him. Is that the price of admission that you're willing to pay to be with him? The occasional three-way? Or is the three-way the foot in the door, the camel's nose under the tent? Is the three-way his way of manipulating you into gradually paying the price of admission yourself and winding up backing into a polyamorous relationship that you didn't want to be in at the outset. You need to have a conversation with your boyfriend about that. What does this mean? What does this portend to the for the future? Is this the beginning of the end? Because I don't want to be in a polyamorous relationship. I don't want both of us to have multiple partners or for you to have multiple partners. So this would be the beginning of the end if this is tiptoeing toward polyamory. Or is this something that we can compartmentalize and contain? Is this something that we can have the occasional sexual adventure together, invite a very special guest star into our bed together? And this can be that kind of monogamy. Monogamy with the asterisks. monogamish me. Monogamish. We are monogamous. We are mostly monogamous. We occasionally have a three-way. We are monogamous. Maybe you could do that, but you're going to have to have a better understanding of your boyfriend's intentions going forward. And you're going to have, you know, he might tell you what you want to hear. Oh no, just the very occasional three-way, no designs on trying to back you into the polyamorous relationship at the outset six months ago, six long months ago, you told me you did not want to have. And then see, 
then you're going to have to use your common sense. He may tell you one thing while doing another, pursuing another goal. If you get the sense that he is being dishonest and he's being manipulative and he is attempting to get the relationship that he wanted at the outset from you that you still don't want, then as nice as he is, as much as you guys enjoy each other's company on as many levels as you click, you're not sexually compatible. And sexual compatibility is important and is something that we should prioritize along with everything else. And if that's the case, if you are not fundamentally sexually compatible, you will have to end this relationship. Hi, Dan. I'm a 20-year-old male, and I've never really been in a relationship. Whenever I talk to a girl, I instantaneously want it to go to a relationship instead of it being a long-term friendship. And then I get mad at the girl if she, what we young people call, friend zones me. I was curious, whenever I talk to a girl, I seem desperate. Um, I was wondering how I could get over that seeming desperate, or if you had any advice for when I find my first relationship, how not to sound desperate. Thank you for unpacking what friend zone means. For all of us old timers who weren't paying attention 30, 40 years ago when that expression first came in to use. There's some advice I gave a long time ago in Savage Love. It's some of the most requested advice that I ever gave, meaning people write in to me asking for a link to this advice because they want to share it with a young person that they know or they ask me to rerun it in the column, which I've done a few times. And it was advice for someone about five years your junior, a 15-year-old who was feeling anxious about wanting to have their first relationship, wanting to meet the girlfriend, and it wasn't happening for them yet. And it sometimes doesn't happen for people at the rate that they would like it to happen for them or at the clip or on the schedule that they would like it to happen for them. Recently answered a letter in the column from a 30-year-old virgin. So you're not alone, caller, in being a little frustrated that it hasn't happened for you yet, they haven't met your first girlfriend yet. And the advice I gave to the horny, unhappy, lonely 15-year-old anxious for his first relationship went like this. Worry less about getting your young teenage self laid and start thinking about getting your 18 to 20 year old self laid. Join a gym and get yourself a body that girls will find irresistible. All right, asterisks there. People find different kinds of bodies irresistible for all sorts of different reasons and you can get an irresistible body just on your own doing nothing or at the gym depending on who you wish to attract. Moving on to the next bit of advice from this old column, read, read books so you'll have something to say to girls. The best way to make girls think you're interesting is to actually be interesting and get out of the house and do shit. Political shit, sporty shit, arty shit, any shit so that you'll meet different kinds of girls in different kinds of settings and become comfortable talking with them. Some more orders from this column, which may apply to you. Get a decent haircut, use deodorant, floss your teeth, take regular showers, wear clean clothes, go online and read about birth control and sexually transmitted infections, and learn enough about the female anatomy that you'll be able to find a clitoris in the dark. Masturbate in moderation, no more than 10 times a day, and vary your masturbatory routine. I can't emphasize this last point enough. A vagina does not feel like a clenched fist, nor does a mouth, an anus, titty fucking dry humping, or easton. If you don't want to be sending me another pathetic letter in five years after you land that first girlfriend complaining about your inability to come unless you're beating your own meat you will vary your routine now so that you'll be able to respond to different kinds of sexual stimulation once you do start getting the girls okay caller people don't put potential romantic partners into the quote-unquote friend zone for arbitrary reasons people are attracted to you or they're not attracted to you. If the only reason you're making friends with girls is to get into their pants, they can sense that there's something fundamentally dishonest going on in this relationship, in this exchange, in your exchanges with them, that you're interested in something that they are not interested in, but they don't want to be rude or they don't feel that they are allowed to be rude to you because you're a dude and dudes are scary and women are socialized to defer to men and not bruise their fragile egos. So rather than tell you that they're just not interested, they tell you they're not interested in you in that way, or they allow a friendship to develop that they know is fundamentally dishonest because they're just trying to sidestep your primary interest, which is romantic and sexual. So don't forge fraudulent friendships. Sorry about the alliteration there. Don't make friends with girls that you would like to go on dates with. If there's a girl that you're interested in, Ask her out explicitly and directly. Would you like to go on a date? I am interested in you in that way. 
And then if she says she's not interested in you that way, thank her for her time. Don't get angry. You just, you've been told the truth. You haven't been friend zoned. You haven't been played. You've been sent on your way. And the sooner you're sent on your way by a girl who's not interested in you the way that you're interested in her, the sooner you're going to cross paths with a girl who is interested in you the way you are interested in her. So get out there, meet girls, talk to girls. Don't stick around long enough being a fake, fraudulent friend to get friend-zoned. Be honest about your intentions. Be honest about what your interests actually are. You're interested in them romantically. And take a big, fat, fucking chill pill. How do you come across as less desperate? You distract yourself so you seem less desperate. That's why I want to circle back to that advice I gave that 15-year-old a long time ago. Get out there and do shit so that you're constantly interacting with people. And women are half the people out there in the world that you will be interacting with because you are fortunate enough not to live in Saudi fucking Arabia. Half the people you're going to interact with are going to be women people. And you will become more comfortable interacting with women generally if you are interacting with them at political events or arty events or sport events or whatever so that you can relax and be yourself and they can maybe get a feel for who you are as a person when your focus isn't how do I get a girlfriend? How do I get a girlfriend? How do I get laid? How do I get laid? When your focus is... How do we get John Ossoff elected? When your focus is, how do we turn out as many people to this anti-Trump march as we possibly can? When your focus is, we got to build the set because the play opens next weekend, you'll be more yourself and chiller while you're doing something with people, with other people, half of whom will be women. And maybe that way, when a girl can see who you are when you're not coming after her, coming at her, or forming a fake friendship with her because you have an ulterior motive, which is like to get into her pants – It's fine to have motives. Just don't have ulterior motives. Have upfront motives. The sooner you're interacting with people, hang out with women, the sooner you're likely to meet one, the less desperate you'll seem if you are distracted in those moments. So worry less about getting your 20-year-old self laid. Worry more about getting your 22, 23, 24-year-old self laid. Get out there in the world. Start doing stuff that's not about girls. Start doing stuff that's about you and your interests. And I promise you, you will meet girls along the way. Finally, you asked for advice on how not to sound desperate when you do find a relationship. Think about why you would be desperate once you find that relationship. And usually what people mean when they say something like that is they're terrified that the relationship could end. And that terror, terror of being single again, can lead people to do dumb and desperate things like agree to anything the other person wants, like stay in an abusive relationship, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, or just stay in an awful shitty relationship because they're in such terror of being alone. They're so desperate not to be alone again. If you don't want to seem desperate once you're in a relationship for the first time, tell yourself every day that there are worse things than being alone. Being with somebody who's awful and not the right person for you, a right person for you. There's no the right person. There's lots of potential right people out there. Being with someone who's not a right person for you is worse than being alone. Better to be alone than to be with someone who is awful or in a relationship that makes you miserable. And so you want to build a life for yourself where you are content whether you're alone or partnered because then you won't seem desperate when you're out there meeting people because you have a rich and full life that brings you joy and contentment, whether you're partnered or not. And you won't seem desperate when you're with someone because they'll know on some level that you'll be fine if the relationship ends, that they're not going to be able to take you for granted or abuse you because if it comes to that, you're going to walk, that you're not so desperate to be in a relationship that you will put up with anything. Hi, Dan. I'm calling about episode 555 and the woman whose boyfriend was Uh, kind of aggressively pestering her for details about her past sexual history. Uh, Normally, I think you give great advice, especially to women who are in sort of borderline or actually emotionally uh, abusive relationships. So I feel like you missed the mark with her. She called to say, hey, I have this situation where my boyfriend has these demands of me. And when I don't give him a certain amount of information, which in my opinion is a really reasonable thing to do, he gets sulky and moody and bullies me until I come around to giving him what he wants. Uh, I guess because you're super sex positive and you really want to encourage people with that, that's great. But to me, that just sounds like a situation where this guy is being an abusive asshole. Uh, And then when you had her on the phone, you didn't really ask her about the context of that. And your advice to her was basically about how to cheer her boyfriend up and make him happy so he won't be mad at her all the time. And uh, you didn't have the conversation where you said, hey, 
it's not okay for him to bully you and to use his sad feelings to pressure you into divulging information about your life, sexual or not, that you didn't. You just told her how to cheer him up and said, that'll fix the problem, which is kind of like saying to someone, oh, if you stop making your boyfriend so mad, he'll stop punching you in the face. No, you really have to say, look, it's not cool what he's doing. Maybe there's something you can understand in it, blah, blah, blah. But he's the one with the problem here, not her. And I wish she had told her that. Hi, uh, this is a comment for the woman on episode 555 who was getting sick of her fiance asking about her past sexual experiences. Uh, she claims that he said he didn't get turned on hearing those stories, but as somebody who gets super turned on hearing those stories about his girlfriend's past sexual experiences, uh, I would suggest that the next time they're having sex, that she asked him in the middle of a sex act, fucking whatever, hey, do you want to hear a story about one of my past sexual experiences? And I would bet any amount of money that uh, his dick would get even harder than it might already be. Just a suggestion. Hi, this is a message or a comment for the guy in episode 555 whose roommate was being really abusive to his girlfriend. I was that 23-year-old girl at one point in my life, and it took my ex-boyfriend's roommate to sit me down and tell me all of the same things that Dan just suggested you tell your friend. You need to tell her that your roommate is being abusive to her. She might not see it, but when you sit down and talk to her, it may be exactly what she needs to hear in order to see the light. All right, we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to put a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz, 206-302-2064. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Michael Hobbs on Twitter at rotten in denmark and be sure to stock up on impeach the motherfucker already wear t-shirts hats buttons at itmfa.org all proceeds benefit the american civil liberties union planned parenthood and the international refugee assistance project the savage love cast is produced every week by nancy hartunian and me and the tech savvy at rescue then nancy i'll be back after next week with the installment of the savage love cast 